a good episode planned for you today. I can't wait to share it with you. I'm so glad you're here and we hope that you are safe uh, since there's all sorts of wild weather going on in North America. And to help me do it is, of course, you know him. I love him. It's my little brother and producer. The person I have roped into most of my shenanigans. Every Monday. Yeah. Here we go again on our own. Going down that lonely. Ah. <clears throat> Did you see on the new logo I put, you know, what was it? Since 2020. No, I missed that part. Here, let me help. Ah. Uh. <laughs> You're welcome. So we started. I say, shouldn't it be since like, you know, 1980 something? Do you want me to put that instead? I just meant like our podcast mm. as the Awkward Siblings. We started August of 2020. What was it called back in the 2000s? It was called the Glory and Tom Show. Ah. Uh. Back when we had to act as our own server. So far back. So long ago, Apple had us listed. <sighs> Only recorded after 2 a.m. Yeah, I remember. How many times do we record that intro? I don't know, Tom. Somewhere you have the old recordings and you have all these Giggle Fest recordings. Yeah. As well as that time I tried to make Carbonara just from a description I had read. That was... um. Yeah, that was something. That was definitely a form of special but still edible. I mean, yes. That part is true. So, Tom, here we are. It's just the awkward siblings today. Like it so often. I mean, it seems fitting, especially for... I love everyone's like, yeah, this is a great subject. And then, of course, instantly hides. Well, I think some people would love to be here, but extenuating circumstances such as Maggie is uh, hiding from a tornado. Who knows if she even has her voice back or not. Right? Yeah. Um, Laura's doing laundry. Hmm. Megan's working on job prospects. And Charlie has meetings all day today. I mean, it reminds me of, you know, every June of my childhood. Yep. The Happy month birthday. I could not get any of my friends together. I know. Happy birthday, Tom. Thanks. Let us never bring it up again. All right. I really, I really do feel, you know, like our mo I now understand our mother so much better. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, it's just anniversaries. Mm-hmm. <sighs> so, Tom. Why are we talking about small talk? 
By the way, y'all, Tom started the dishwasher right before the show. I can't hear anything from your mic or anything. Oh, because it's quite loud here. Like the cat woke up. From her warm, happy place. Yep. You're just in a kitty pile. She's in my lap. Let's see. Tom, Tom proposed this episode too. How to do small talk and its importance, how to give compliments and tell jokes. So That's Tom's proposal for today's episode. What he wants to tell younger Tom about the importance of small talk and compliments and how to tell jokes. Oh my God, how long have I coached you on how to tell jokes? Oh, I still suck at them. How many decades? At least three now. But I mean, so it was, excited. and I was just reminded because I see this a lot on Instagram, my Instagram feed and other ones and Twitter and stuff where you know, I've got ADHD and spe other spectrum, you know, people, discussion groups of, there's this confusion about why, why should we talk about inconsequential things? Like the weather? Like the weather. Why does like everyone, egg prices. Like egg prices. Like the sports ball events that, you know, happen every week. Okay, I have to tell you, I recently found out that murder ball is the actual name for the sport. Yes, I know. And I don't understand why ESPN doesn't have more coverage. Look, why, why is ESPN failing in general in this coverage? I miss the Ocho. I, they, I checked the ESPN app. They do not have, they don't carry any coverage of cornhole sports anymore. It's literally the beanbag throwing game from, yeah. um, from uh, the, what was that clown show? Bozo. Mm -hmm. Bozo. Bozo, from Bozo's Clown Show. Right? And, and they don't, and I mean, I mean, like, obviously, Bozo's Clown Show came after cornhole as a sport, but nevertheless, you're throwing beanbags into a hole in a piece of wood and you get points and ES and they have championships and tournaments and ESPN is like, we don't know this sport. And I just don't know what to do with that. Like we live in a world where you could stream anything and ESPN's like hard pass. Also, I'm so grateful that the marble races are still on uh, YouTube because, again, ESPN does not understand this is what we came for. Yes. But I mean, and so everyone's like, but why don't you, why don't people just want to talk about the big things? And then it's like, because humans be human. And we don't all want to immediately deal with heav possibly heavily dramatic and emotional subjects all the time. Sometimes we like to just be part of a group. And small talk is how you figure out the group consensus of the emotions everyone's having right now. Are we all safe? Are we all happy? Do we have some problems in our life we need help with? It's how you socialize and group bond. Big discussions are almost transactional in that they require one person to lay a case for something and the others to decide if they want to join this case. Mm -hmm. Versus small talk is how you form a group, how you form a social group that wants to be together and communicate and they like each other and so they can better trust each other's opinions and they understand what kind of opinions other people have. I mean, I also, also kind of want to talk because of our upbringing about what is the difference between gossip and backbiting. Yes. They are not the same. They are not the same. But CB also totally agrees with you. Marble racing is fantastic. But of the reason we have all these little things to talk about, including why do we talk about the weather? 
is because it's the same reason why on what is the most popular things to do on a first date when you go out with someone to see if there is potential for more with them. And it's because you need a neutral subject to better understand the other person without stuff that will will inadvertently probably offend because you don't know them yet and you don't know if you really want to offend them or not. So you talk about a neutral subject. You go see a movie, you go see a play, and you talk about something that is not related to either of you. And that's why we talk about the weather. I think also because they are safe subjects. Um, and you don't want to ruin a good time, especially if it's the first time. Mm -hmm. Or where you're establishing a relationship or feeling it out for what kind of relationship you will have. Whether it be just an acquaintanceship or just a passing knowledge of each other or maybe even, you know, a regular friendship that you regularly see each other. But you toe dip in. People talk about toe dipping like it's a bad thing. It is not a bad thing. You know why it's not a bad thing? Because if you just jumped into the ice cold water, it could be a shock to your heart. Like, that's not a good thing. <laughs> so, yes, you toe dip in so you won't get a shock. Because nobody needs that kind of stress, especially in this day and age. Nobody needs that kind of stress. Um, so, small talk is very useful, very powerful. Also, small talk, if you're doing it right, can be quite enjoyable. Again, Talking about marble racing and the weather and chicken egg prices or whatever, um, you know, you've got maybe even some witticisms to share about that subject that you've worked on. Um, everybody loves a little pun or a little wit. Or, I mean, if you have lived in an area, you can either compare notes about, you know, your strategies for the month you're in. Mm -hmm. in the upcoming times or share knowledge and gain knowledge from, you know, if, if there is a huge time difference between how long you've been there and the person you're talking to has lived in that area. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the first things Gloria and I both do whenever we meet someone new who's, you know, come to the South. Oh dear. Is, you know, we warn them about the end of July and August that there is some unique problems down here during that time where it gets so hot animals will die if they are not actively air conditioned and given enough water and cool places and shade like it is a dangerous time to be outside as well for humans of like you do not make plans to go running at the end of july around here People will just drop. When I was a child, uh, they would announce on the 6 or 10 o'clock news um, who had died from heat exposure uh, in late July and early August. It was called the dog days of summer down here. And I remember since mom and dad watched the news, I don't know why dad watched the news so much. It's not like it changed that much from the six o'clock news to the 10 o'clock, but okay. I guess just four hours, but um, he would watch both and they would, you know, say at the six o'clock that, um, you know, reports are that an elderly person has died from heat exhaustion from being in an unair conditioned house. And then by the 10 o'clock, they would usually have the name or somebody would call in like, I know who it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> Da, da, da. Uh, it's my cousin da, da, da. and um, and they would then say their name on the news but like it was I remember what year was it it was it was 89 it was the summer before we moved up to Oxford um, the first two weeks of August there was almost every single day there was a report of a person or an animal dying from the heat and every single day they would have a warning about uh if you leave your dogs and cats and your chickens and your livestock outside 
be sure that they have um, adequate shade and water to drink or, you know, they could die. And they made this announcement constantly throughout the day and every evening they would then report on so-and-so lost their entire flock of chickens today because also, the water, the water in his neighborhood got cut off and he didn't know and he was at work. And so the water fountain stopped working for the chickens and they all died when he came home. And the man would just call into the news to tell them and, you know, say how he's blaming the water. <laughs> You're like, it's the deep south. But, um, you know, it's still like, it's, it's important. So yeah, every time Tom and I meet new people who are new to here, we're like, so is this your first, is this going to be your first summer, uh, down here? Have you never done summer in South Mississippi before? And, you know, most of the time it's like, no, I, I've never, I heard it's a doozy here. It's like, yeah. And we'll explain. It's very serious. People can die. It is, it's because of the humidity coupled with 90 plus degree, 99 degree heat. Uh, you can't evaporate and cool your skin when you sweat. And that is how people, um, you know, don't make it. Yes, it's what everyone now is learning. It's called a wet bulb event. Yes. So, yeah, we always like, hey, listen, when people warn you, it's true. And also do not uh, be really careful about your salts. Nobody watches their salt in July and August down here because you sweat so much. You'll be fine. If anything, the real problem is you don't have enough salts. And so, like, I'll also tell them to taste the uh, sweat on their upper lip. And if it tastes like water or it tastes sweet, they have got to get salt immediately, salt and sugar, because they're in a dangerous situation. Um, without adequate salts, you'll just, you'll sweat till you're dangerously dehydrated and then um, you start raving. Your brain will boil like a hot kebab. And that is small talk, but it is a way of without any any burden, um, emotional or, you know, have to act or anything, a way to show, though, that you do care about the other person and that you have some knowledge to share and how you share it, it gives a lot of little subtle indicators about the kind of relationship you can expect from someone. So, like, you know, we see what Gloria is concerned about. We see how she cares. She's bringing up animals. It's not just people. Um we see, you know, we see that she is serious and this is something, you know, she's concerned about for everyone. And just, you pick up a lot of these little things from small talk. You don't have to ask them. You don't have to worry about, are they being honest? Are they deceiving me or anything? It's, you see how they talk about something says a lot about who they are and their character and their concerns and thoughts. Mm, I'm so sorry, CB. You got to be careful. In the summertime with dehydration, heat exhaustion is very unpleasant to deal with. It can take weeks, if not months, to recover. Oh, yeah. I've, I've had to deal with it a few times, and it's never fun. And why does it take so long? You think you just pump enough waters back in, into your body, you'd be fine. No. No, your body doesn't trust you anymore. I, re I remind Tom every time, you know what they say, Englishmen and mad dogs go out in the midday sun. I mean, it's one nice thing, though, about being in South Mississippi is for the most part, though, everything's air conditioned. Yeah because it's just not survivable in summer. And this isn't actually anything that new, even when, um, who was down here? Was it the Chickasaw? No, the Choctaw, or this Choctaw. is the Choctaw prop. This is all Choctaw land. Pretty much almost all of Mississippi is just purely Choctaw land. 
of they were not down here in summer. No, um, where they go is the Gulf Coast, like literally on the beach where there's always a breeze. And there are trees there right along the beach, uh, right along the shoreline. And then um, the other place that they would go is up to North Mississippi near the Mississippi-Alabama border um, where the first mound where humans first came out of uh, is located. Um, but they didn't go there in the summertime every year. They only went... Um, like once every five to 10 years to go meet with the Chickasaw who would travel there. So, cause the Chickasaw and the Choctaw are like sister tribes. And this is where their mutual um, first humans came out of the mound and then split off into the Chickasaw and the Choctaw. Uh, so they would meet like on an agreed upon every so many years to you know, have a ceremonial thing and a whole family reunion. And I assume exchange young people who uh, I assume it was sort of a <laughs> see if some, if a cousin looks good kind of deal. Uh, and, and then go back to uh, their usual uh, places in the summertime would be along the coastline. Because again, you need that breeze and uh, South Mississippi does not have a breeze because it is in a little valley. But yeah, like, it is, it's too hot to normally stay in the summer. And that's just like, no, it's always been a warning down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have so but, many pine trees, there's no breeze. Because the trees interrupt the, the breeze. Uh, and so it's that we are able to achieve super humidity, which is a real thing. It's 120% humidity. And you think, but Glory, 100% humidity, 100% anything is the most you can have. And it turns out, no. No, this is a weather phenomenon that, again, most people who are not from around here don't know. There is so much organic particulates in the air, i.e. pollen, that it can, all of the pollen can hold on to humidity and it actually makes the air super saturated with moisture, which is how we then have catfish and mudskippers will literally walk out of their ponds and start walking down the road because it's so super humid that they don't dry out and they're looking for more oxygenated watering holes because uh, that is one of the things um, the plants will use up all in the, in the ponds, in the watering holes, they'll use up all the oxygen in the water and the fish can't breathe. So they go walking which is a wild thing if you've ever been driving around a back road in Mississippi and there are literal fish just walking on these unpaved roads and it's like, oh, we got to leave. We, we just need to go. I, I can't deal with this stuff anymore. I can't. This is a little too surreal. And let's go to the city where things are less fantastical and whimsical. I cannot handle this. This is big fish country. I can't deal with this. But again, telling those kind of stories is part of small talk. Because people will be like, you actually saw real fish walking on the road? I've heard tell, but I've never actually like, you don't live in the country, huh? You don't go drive into the country. Like, no, not really, no. <laughs> well, that's why you haven't seen it. <laughs> because you have to go out to the country where the fish do not stay in their watering holes. Nope. They have a mind of their own and they go looking for greener water. <laughs> they go looking for happier, wetter water. Right? And maybe like some lovely ladyfish. I don't know. It's... But, but yes, of this is how you find out what the commonalities you have with other people. This is how you find out what you can talk. Like, Instead of having to remember a long list of here's all my subjects I like to talk about and I like to, you know, and what do you like? You let somebody express themselves and then they return the favor. And you slowly start to figure out what you both like in common. And then it's not so serious. It's not, you know, so judgy about, oh, would you like that? Uh -huh. 
you know, weird gatekeeping people. Mm-hmm. Of, it is very important because it is how we secure social bonds. You want lasting friendships, you have to talk to them. In the Deep South, swapping stories is a form of small talk and friendship bonding. I've had people I've only chatted with once before flag me down at various stores. Like, I have a story for you. Like, oh, yeah, what you got? And then they're like, I've been hoping to come meet you or come across you for months. I have to tell you the story. And again, that is a form of bonding. And it's like, oh, yeah, let's go to a coffee shop or... Let's go sit somewhere, have a Coke, and tell me your story. And we'll then get to know each other better. But swapping little stories is a form of small talk and also friendship bonding. And that actually kind of gets to me about the other part that to me goes with small talk. And it's also, you know, what I hear so much with adults of how do I form new friendships? Mm -hmm. And I learned this from a great book, Glory Got, of, so to have these talks, these little discussions, you need something to talk about. And while, yes, there is always the weather because we're all experiencing at the same time. Another great trick is to have little things showing your you know, what we now call fandoms, but are just things you're always interested in and you're always happy to talk about. So like, you know, case in point, this shirt Glory Got Me is, you know, a little bit of a deep cut, but if you get the reference, it is a great opener for anyone else to talk to me about of, you know, Miracle Max. And if you recognize it, you're like, oh, you like Princess Bride. You know, you can talk about that movie. Obviously, I am definitely someone who likes it and I'm open to discussing it. And it's when you want to open up a conversation and meet someone new, you need something to talk about. And a great way is to compliment them of what is it you like about them. And that's why I thought it was part of the same subject as small talk. And it's one of the, there's the book. I put the link in the chat to her website, to this book. How to and talk to anyone. Yes, that is below on the same page. She does have links. Um, as well as like she has links to her other stuff. But this book is such a good... Um, example of if you feel socially awkward, if you feel um, that you're not as confident as you would like to be when initiating or when you're just having conversations with strangers or even people you know and you just are like, I don't know what to talk about or I don't know how to talk about small things. I cannot recommend this book enough. Yes. Um, it is absolutely worth it. Even if perhaps you feel like you do, you're confident, you're pretty good at it. You, you might still pick up new things. Our mother was a consummate conversationalist, could strike up a conversation with anyone on the planet. No, and really. she still, when I loaned this book to her, she loved it. She bought her own copies of both the physical book and the audio book to listen to because it had so many wonderful ideas and tips and tricks for initiating conversations, participating in conversations, how to keep conversations going. And so that it feels effortless. Like I used to feel that conversating with others was a chore. It was exhausting. And a lot of that had to do with my masking. But what I found out was Leo Lowndes really was wonderful at explaining how to converse easily with anyone else on the planet. Even people that you don't share a language with. She really does have tips on how to have a conversation 
with another person where neither of you speaks the same language. And I have tried it out and it absolutely works. We're not sponsored, but gosh, we'd love to meet her. She's like, she's just great ideas. Also, it's very readable. Yes. It, it was a game changer for us, for our family. Uh, and everyone else who's ever read this book has told me it's been an absolute game changer for them. Just to like have easier conversations. Also, ways to get other people to initiate conversation with you so you don't have to do the work of figuring out who wants to talk and who doesn't. But yeah, like, so one of the things is how to give a compliment. And one, make sure it's something genuine, something you actually do like about them. But secondly, and I really feel like it is one of the most important things for everyone to learn, is you compliment somebody on their choice. You do not compliment people on their genetics. That's why saying, you know, telling someone, hey, you've got great legs is not a real compliment unless you already know them and you know that they go to the gym or and they do specific things to get their legs to look a certain way for a competition or something that they are putting effort into it. But if that's just how they're born, that's not a compliment. Yeah, like a bodybuilder saying, hey, you got great definition on your legs. That's a compliment. That bodybuilder is definitely trying to sculpt the look of their body. But... It's if it's not obvious that this person is doing specific things to make their legs look a certain way, then probably steer clear of their physical body. So instead, you do the choices on if they, you know, the way they style their hair, the, you know, the clothing they wear, especially if they have, you know, little fandom clues on it or if they've got pins. For different things. I mean, they've got so many different pins now for every fandom, flags, you name it. Of It is a great way to start a conversation of something they chose to wear or do. Um, as well as, you know, even if, if you see them do a good deed, you know, you can say that was really great. Or, you know, you hit, or, you know, if you see some, you know, one, everyone in customer service of like, you know, you handled that so well. I don't know how you stayed so calm. It was inspiring. You know, like, can I get you a drink when you get off work? You know, that type of. Mm -hmm. uh, their choices is what a, is what is valid, what you should validate. As well as, you know, in kids too. You validate kids for their behaviors that they chose to do, not the stuff that they didn't have a choice in. Mm-hmm. And, and that part is so important to remember because validating somebody's choices always makes them feel happier and some, and they want to then, you know, help create a friendship over because obviously you share the same values they do. Complimenting something nobody has a choice in, you know, of, you know, just you're part of that group. Yeah, you don't know why they're there. But yeah, like I always want to remind people, yeah, give compliments about genuinely valid things you like. So now you've got a conversation starter of shared views and thoughts and beliefs. And that's what you can build a friendship on. And yes, our mother really could start a conversation with anyone. She put this to good use several times times in her work life mm -hmm. as uh, she, among her many jobs she was an interviewer for um what was the government project oh the longitudinal study the the preserving yeah the one preserving old stories one. Oh no that's a different one um yeah the oral history project yeah of just you know getting of getting these stories out of people by just, you know, you talk and people mm -hmm. want to share, they want to be seen and they want to, you know, 
know other people understand their experiences. And, you know, she was really good at the oral history project. Yep. And so, yeah, we learned from her. I mean, we're just saying something because it ain't easy when you're neurodivergent mm -hmm. of how do you pick up a conversation with anyone if you don't really have a good instinct for what they might be thinking about. And it's you look for clues on them. You know, whatever. If you ever talk to somebody who's a professional um Oh, what is it? Not sociologist. What's the department at USM that never has enough funding because they never remember to ask for more? Anthropology. That's it. Um, they don't even have a paper budget. Well, the paper budget hasn't been updated in 40 years. Yeah. But an anthropologist will tell you that you can tell a lot just by the way somebody dresses, by the way they walk who they hang around, how closely they stand to other people. Their body language, everything tells you little bits about people. If you just look, you'll see a lot about someone, including like, are they stooping? Are they trying to seem small? Do they always have, swing their arms? You can tell a lot about somebody's personality by just how they express themselves. And once you see someone you want to meet, look and see if they have any Thing you note that you can talk about. I mean, it is totally valid to, you know, compliment somebody's, you know, eyeshadow because they chose which ones and how to put that on. That alone, you know, that's a great, you know, cat's eye. Mm -hmm. How long have you been practicing that, you know, flip? Oh, there's so much out there. But once you share, you know, your common values, then you can get into deeper discussions. But first you need to know you share something in common. And, you know, and they've, um, they've researched it. You want to have a friendship, you need 100 hours together. That is why it was so much easier to have friendships when you were in school. It wasn't that you were meeting so many more people or, or you meet so few, so many fewer people now. You really don't as an adult. You actually meet more people. But you spend more time with people. And so it's easier to build up those hours of just being around someone to understand them. So what's your favorite small talk, Glory? And it honestly depends on the situation or the location I'm in. I was mostly thinking of the, um, what is it that you always get trapped by the party ninjas? Whenever you're at a party, invariably, somehow they will quarter you. What is it they love to talk to you so much about? It just depends. Hmm. Like, it's, you know, what their favorite drink at the party is, or maybe it's about something that happened that day or the day before at work, or it could be any number of things. It's Yeah, around here, that doesn't remind me, like... I love a good story. The small talk around here in town where we are is with, um, so the local university, one of the local universities, uh, the baseball team has actually oh, done yeah, really well this year. Talk. Yeah. And so the teams they're playing against, you know, in the big tournaments now as they're getting, you know, to the end of the season, uh, one of them asks, you know, like, what kind of, what kind of place is this? They don't even have an Applebee's. To which the city responded with, here's like a list of 200 plus restaurants we have in this town. What are you talking about? And they just, because they were harping on about, y'all don't even have an Applebee's. Y'all, nobody liked the Applebee's here. That's why we don't have an Applebee's. It wasn't that good. And if your idea of, you know, food and the food you need is Applebee's, we're not sad. We're not sad, to see, you know. But this is what everyone's been talking about, is the why do they love Applebee's too much, so much and everyone else's views about Applebee's. There is an article in the local newspaper today 
a mission to explain Tennessee weaponizing Applebee's versus the team. And in uh, the Alabama website, Hattiesburg claps back at Tennessee fan who said Mississippi City sucks for lack of Applebee's. Of the, this is inconsequential. There is nobody has a real stake in Applebee's. Not even is, Applebee's. Yeah. <laughs> My God, that place sucks. Uh, but this is a great subject for small talk because you can talk about you know your views about restaurants. You can talk about you know, why would other people care so much? I think one of the lines I said lately to one of my friends that I was surprised how much they enjoyed was the, I think I would respect them more if this was about Waffle House. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Waffle House is kind of the, the place you go after you've been drinking type of like, yeah, it's not a fancy place or, you know, known for its amazingly special food. But it's a fun subject to talk about. Everyone's got an opinion, and there's no real wrong opinion. But it's a way for us to all express ourselves and to get a sense of other people. And we can all laugh about this. Of like, how how small, of a, how young a kid is this that they're like, but no Applebee's, how will we have an after party without Applebee's? Yeah, we've all been we've all been laughing in town on this one. Let's see. It recently was thrust prominently back into the popular culture with its inclusion in Walker Hayes' hit country song "Fancy Like," which links a date night of Bourbon Street steaks and Oreo shakes to the rural high class. But on Saturday, the Twitter jabs that tried to use Applebee's to diminish Hattiesburg hosting the Super Regional hasn't made it across the bar in Laurel. In fact. It was business as usual around lunchtime with slow traffic and plenty of seating available. Yes, nobody's going to Applebee's. It sucks. And I believe our team beat University of Tennessee. Did they ever play? Because like, it kept getting delayed. Yeah, it was best of three. They won best of three. Okay. I mean, um, we do have a pretty good baseball team. So. I like football. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, I love you, Laura. It's like truly a not surprised here. Small talk in my work is what movies have you seen lately? What games have you played? What software have you tried lately? What side project are you doing for fun? Like if I'm going to the movies, whether I'm with people or by myself, if I see some other people who seem jovial, who seem open, I will, like, if, if it's something where, like, this is, like, a hyped movie, I will, you know, say, well, let's find out what happens, you know, to whatever character, or let's see how Arnold Schwarzenegger gets himself out of this one, or whatever, you know, comment. And the person will smile, like, yeah, I can't wait. You know, like, like especially if they're holding popcorn, like, they're, like, in it for the haul, then I know that they're definitely, like, looking forward to the experience of seeing it in a movie theater. So I'll strike up a conversation with them. And again, there's no wrong answer. Other than I want to enjoy this and I hope you want to, and you're planning to enjoy this too. That's, that's the right answer to all of these is, Hey, you ready to go have some fun? Yeah. I'm planning to try to have some fun here. Right. Or can you believe these egg prices? I might as well start raising my own. You know, or whatever, even if I still have no intention of getting yard dinosaurs. I know Tom wants yard dinosaurs. You in my industry watch movies to see what other companies have done for technical achievements and inspiration. And I assume to oh, have a good time. Oh, Laura, there. my first thought, I was thinking about you um, over the weekend when we watched um, uh. the new season of The Lake. And... <laughs> At one point, you know, a building is, you know, they show a building burning as all the fireworks go off in it. And all I'm, I'm looking at that and all I'm thinking is, I wonder how much that fire costs. Because that is mostly computer made fire. Yeah. 
I mean, because, and I'll be perfectly honest, I only realized how complex Spire is because of um, that one behind the scenes for the first Deadpool movie. Mm-hmm. Where it showed how many different studios had to work on the same fireball. Yep. To make this thing look right. Yeah, everybody's got to add their layers. Yeah. Lloyd's dead a few burning buildings in CG. I mean, but it is so much safer. Yes, it is. Because it used to be how much gasoline we got and uh, how many fire crews do we have on call mm -hmm. is how big a fireball we can afford. Yeah, the pyrotechnic technicians. Yeah. So, but like, it just depends. I usually start up conversations that at locations specific to that location. Hence, like at the grocery store. If only I could find one ripe tomato in this place. Um, versus the movie theater. Let's see how Arnold gets himself out of this problem. Or or whatever, you know. Whatever is the appropriate phrase. You know, let's see what Captain Marvel's up to. I don't know. Um, and, like, it just depends on where I am. Or, um... Like if I'm at a food court at a mall and I overhear two people talking about, well, which one should we go to? This one or this one? If I have an opinion, I'll say, oh, such and such has really good whatever. I just had it and it was delicious. Like I'll just, yeah, because like people are not sure and they're saying it out loud, uh, you know, and they're saying it loud enough. They kind of, if anybody has an opinion, speak now. Went on an airplane. So are you visiting or coming home? Yeah. Exactly. Or have you ever been to this city before? I wondered if you had any tips. Or is there any good place? Are you Have you been here before? Oh, yeah. This is uh, my hometown. Oh, is there any restaurants you could recommend or sites to see that you, you think are definitely worth it? Like if somebody asked me that in Hattiesburg, hey, I'm new here. I would say if you absolutely can get a chance, you should go to the African American Military History Museum. It is so flipping cool. And it's either low cost or free. I can't remember at this point. Um, but it has the coolest displays. And several of them you can sit in and have your picture taken in the setting. It's really cool. Um, highly recommend. And, and I'll tell people, if you can get in, you can um, even have your picture taken with the only female Buffalo soldier uh, she's like, they have her all dressed up and they have her horse. They have a fiberglass replica of her actual horse from the picture. And you can stand next to him. Used to be able to sit on them and sit on the horse. I mean, and have your picture taken. And it is so flipping cool. So again, and then they have a bunch of donated uniforms from every part of the military. And then some, because they also have some NASA stuff. And children can put those clothes on and have their picture taken. So it is really cool. So I always will tell people about that. If they're like, I'm new here. Do you have any recommendations? Or we're just visiting. And it's like, oh, well, you definitely need to do this. And if you um, got nothing, and if you have, and if there's nothing else, always recommend for free. And it's open, you know, most of the time is, you know, the Pocket Museum, which is just this street, this back street with a lot of cool stuff. It's a fun little art installation. Yeah. So again, like there's all sorts of ways to strike up conversations with people. You never know what you're going to get. But honestly, the Lil Lounge book is what gave me the confidence to do that. Um, yeah. Mostly because I was very, I used to be very, very shy. And Leo Lowndes had all these tips, all these ideas for getting people to strike up conversations with you. And there was like at least 20 of them that I thought were actually doable. And I started doing all those, all her tips. And people striking up conversations with me gave me the confidence to start striking up conversations with other people. So I would say it's never too late to gain confidence in being in the outside world, particularly as a neurodivergent person, like there's no reason that this world shouldn't be welcoming to you as well.
but it is a skill. So give it a try. Shall we go ahead and do our first little sprinty sprint? Yep. All right. Now is a wonderful time to see if you have something to drink. Or maybe get a little snacky snack. And we will see you on the flip side.
Welcome, welcome, welcome. How'd everybody's break go? Heated up some leftover shrimp lo mein I made yesterday. Katie is just giving me the stare from across my little tiny room of do something fun. Go on. Yes, I saw she was torn in the hallway when you and I went our separate directions. Mm -hmm. Like, which way should I go? She has now come over twice, like, come on. Papa. You know what I want. Get the red dot. Nice see you made it, Spence. Hi, Spence. Yes, remembered. So what should we talk about, Tom? Um, well, well, yes, I think everyone needs to hear your advice to how do you tell a joke? Really? What's my advice? Start at the beginning and when you get to the middle, give it a pause for just a sec. Make sure you have their attention. And then deliver that punchline. Tell the joke in your head first. Make sure you actually remember all of it. Mm-hmm. Rehearse it first in your head. Yes. Make sure you remember the middle, the beginning, the middle, and then the correct punchline that makes sense for the beginning and the middle. And if you remember all three parts correctly. Then tell the joke and don't forget to give a pause between the middle and the punchline before you give the punchline. Because <laughs> people often will, like, they tell the middle and then they like, if anything, they actually go faster to get to the end. But yeah. you need to give a two beat pause. It's just this beat feet before you deliver the punchline and then you get need to give another two beats after you deliver the punchline for everybody's the gears and everyone's brain to compute and find the funny and that is how you deliver a joke at least that's how i've taught children to do it it seems to work on adults <laughs> and the other part that goes with that that i think is a a great skill and I think we talked about it last week or the week before, is, give me a sec. Kitty demands. Someone is needing some attention in some form. Mm-hmm. Um, practice this in the mirror. Practice your faces. Make sure the expressions you're making you plan to make are what is coming across. Because believe me, there's a big difference between a jovial smile and a grim a grimace of pain. But I've known a lot of people when they're happy that because of, you know, growing up and being told to smile for pictures, their instinctual smile is a grimace. And while that can be funny, you know, make sure you're doing it on purpose. 
Or is everyone looking at you like, oh, did you throw out your back? My mother, our mother, had a group of female friends who were all just slightly younger than her. So, like, five to ten years younger than her. And I used to call them the does something smell bad group because every one of them's listening face was this like they smell something bad it was so hard to sit at a table with them and them swap stories and look at their faces like all they are doing is smelling a dumpster. And my mother and I had multiple conversations about, why don't you ever want to hang out with me and my friends? And I'm like, I don't mind hanging out with you. It's your friends that I cannot stand. She's like, why? And I'm like, because they all look like they just smelled the worst dumpster ever. And I, and I don't know how they sustain these faces for an hour or more, but I just cannot handle it. it I just... I go between being like catching myself trying to mirror it and also laughing because it looks like a joke only they're not kidding. And, and I was like, and the worst part is they're absolutely unaware that that is their listening face and God love my mother. She tried for five years. To get each of them to group together as a group and individually to understand that was their listening face and they needed to work on it. And none of them thought there was anything wrong with their listening face. But also, they did not see any reason to work on it, despite the fact that they essentially were getting feedback from a trusted source, a very close personal friend. And it wasn't until, uh, at the time... Um, flip phones with cameras in them had just really like I had just gotten one. So I started taking pictures of them around the table and I'd email them to them or send them to their phones so they could see what they look like when they're listening. There was a lot of coming to Jesus with their own children of, is that really what I look like when I listen to all their kids are like, yeah, that's, it looks like you're miserable. You look so upset. So again, I like to point out to people of number one, if somebody gives you feedback, even if it is unrequested, it is definitely worth a consideration if they are giving you feedback about your face, like, oh, are you okay? You look really upset or you look sad or whatever, and you don't feel that way, to take into consideration that maybe that is, in fact, how your face looks, and why does your face look that way? How many people know that their constant, that their, you know, quiet listening face, they look constipated? It's like, do you need more fiber in your diet? Yeah, this one. They look like their brain hurts and possibly their butt. And so again, um, it can be disarming for the other people looking at your face since the impression you're trying to make and what your face is communicating can be two diametrically different things. It does not mean anyone is a bad person. It just means that there is room for clarification and possibly even practicing your various faces in the mirror. I understand that not everybody likes looking in the mirror for a variety of reasons, including what is it? Dysmorphia and it's not dystonia. Dysphoria. Dysphoria. Thank you. That there are many reasons why people don't like looking in the mirror. But you don't have to gaze longingly in the mirror at yourself. 
you can even have a friend or family member help you where maybe you're in the bathroom with them and they just, they like, they give you a face like, okay, try practicing your listening face. And you're like, okay, well talk to me. And then we practice it and they're like, okay. And then when they say, look in the mirror, you quickly look to see what you look like. Or they could take a picture of you, like I did with my mother's friends. Boy, that was fascinating. But um, And so that you can see what you actually look like. And you can then try to start practicing um, changing your eyebrows, your cheeks, your lips, even the way you hold your head on your, your shoulders, on your neck, um, to... Make sure that the body language and the face that you are practicing is, in fact, has the meaning that you intended to have. As young children, um, we just mimic what we see. So it's something that I've noticed in children who had a parent with unmedicated depression. Is their listening face... And their quiet face or their contemplative face has a tendency to look sad or angry or very distracted or just miserable, quite honestly, a bunch of like, can you imagine? I used to have to like so many miserable little children and they weren't actually miserable. They had no idea. Um, and that is why. I had children bring mirrors, little, little handheld mirrors to class to practice their face so that they could undo while they were still young, the effects of their caregivers um, under medication. Like there's nothing wrong with being a depressed caregiver. It's just, we need to make sure that we don't that essentially we're not unintentionally giving the side effects of our mental health issues to our children or to the children we're taking care of. So, but I've noticed that some people, like I can honestly tell whose parents had depression or even other mental health issues, um, manic uh, phases, based on their facial expressions as adults. And like, like literally there are certain Richter faces that are kind of common among bipolar folks in a manic face that when I see it on little children and I say little, but I really just mean not teenagers. When I see it on like little seven, eight, nine year old, 10 year old faces, I'm like, Oh, do you have a bipolar parent? And they usually know, they know the mental health statuses of their parents and caregivers, their grandparents, they know everybody's, uh, you know, medical business and they'll tell me and, oh no, my parents, no, my mom and dad don't have bipolar, but my grandma does. Oh, do you spend a lot of time with your grandma? Yes. She used to babysit me before I went to school. So I gather she had a long manic phase one time, huh? Yeah, when I was four. There we go. Okay. How do you know these things, Miss Fink? Oh, I'm like Sherlock Holmes. And it's that um, the child will have these, hey, let's do it. I have a brilliant idea. Let's do it. And it's like, oh, dear. What is this face? You're way too excited. And they're not actually that excited, but they this is they're mimicking what they grew up in. And the, and honestly, that can be an issue if nobody ever tells you, hey, you're mimicking the face of a mental health crisis and you yourself are not experiencing a mental health crisis. This is giving confusing directions to anyone else interacting with you. And it's just, it's one of those, so let's think about as writers, there's this thing that as writers we're supposed to be aware of uh, in our in our stories, what everyone knows. 
in any world, fantasy or uh, in real life, contemporary, there are things that every character already knows, such as how gravity works, how thermodynamics work, um, the voting system in their country, the election system, um, how to buy groceries. See, these are things every character automatically knows. So if for, as a writer, if there's any reason you want to explain, say, how to go shopping, you would need to have a reason for two characters to have this conversation, such as one character is not from this area. And so the other character needs to explain it. And then thereby your readers will also know how maybe shopping works. Maybe, maybe you have to buy coins from the, you know, from the general of the farmer's market. I don't know. You know, I'm making stuff up in order to then purchase in the from the vendors because you have to have the farmer's market currency to purchase and and so on. And you, you trade that whatever it is, there's things what everyone knows. That is true in real life as well. And we need to be aware of there's things like this is a sad face. Now, I'm not giving the full sad face because I'm giving the sympathetic sad face. What's wrong? Having a bad day? Has it been tough? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're here now. Like, that is empathetic, acknowledging, um, and it's lightly mirroring, but not full mirroring to show I don't feel this way, but I'm also not mocking you. I'm trying to be sympathetic toward that versus somebody who's genuinely down in the dumps. They're not giving a sympathetic sad face. They're genuinely sad. But what if you are not sad and your resting face is sad face? People are going to think you're sad all the time, even when you're not. And then you wonder, why does everybody always keep asking me if I'm sad all the time? I'm not sad, but it's starting to make me mad. Maybe there's a reason. So part of good small talk, good communication is making sure your face is saying what you mean it to say and that you are not like my mother's friends where all of them look like they just smelled something very stinky and it's you and they don't understand why they don't have other friends. I mean, and that is, that also though kind of gets to one of the, one of the ways friendships really develop, the way that you show you are part of the group is by mirroring each other's faces and behaviors and expressions. This is a, you know, it's called sinking. Um, this is a common behavior. It is a way to subconsciously show um, that you are part of that group. So like if you are having a little lunch date with a friend, um, after you've been chatting for a little bit, in general, you will, when one of you grabs for their drink, the other about five to eight seconds later will grab for their drink and take about a roughly the same amount of time drink as the other person did. Um, and this is just sinking. It is a mirroring. It is showing that you are both in the same frame of mind. Mm-hmm. And the same goes for your facial expressions. So if the facial expressions you are having are very different than the facial expressions of the rest of the group, the group will feel awkward and not sure how much you want to be part of that group because you are not mirroring what everyone else is feeling. And why are you not feeling the same, hearing the same stories? I mean, you may not, in which case people will then wonder and look to you to explain what is your differing opinion or view or something? But if you don't have a reason, then it's very much a, well, what's going on? Like it gets very uncomfortable. Like you want to make other people uncomfortable in a conversation, simply have a very different facial expression than what everyone else is having. If everyone else is laughing, if you look sad, it'll disconcert them. If they are all sad and you look cheerful and jovial, again, concerning. 
of that is part of what makes small talk successful is you through small talk you very quickly ascertain what is the mental state of the other person what is their mood emotional moods and you can kind of sync up so that you give the same energy level so if they are still waking up you will slow down your speech a little bit maybe quiet your voice a little um because that's how they're also going to be speaking versus that they're really happy and excited and you know they're they're almost you know giddy and jumping up and down you move similarly and you speak a bit louder as well to show that you're in the same mood and you want you're there to participate with them of it is about that mirroring that is part of you know, what helps people develop as friendships is I'm thinking similar to you in this situation. And the small talk helps us sync that up. Because once you're in the same frame of mind, then you can discuss the other things that really are concerning you. And you know, you're coming from a similar place. And that's why we do all these silly little behaviors. You know, why do we all check the time? Um, why do we comment about the time is because we're just checking how other people think and feel to see if it's similar. I love the one around here. Um, people will just say out of the blue out loud anywhere. Oh, can you believe how early the sun is setting these days or depending on the time of year, it's hard to believe that you know just a few months ago the sun was setting before five but now it's just it goes almost to nine i'm like yes time flies this is constantly a conversation starter icebreaker here in south mississippi mm -hmm. as if all of us are not literally decades old and have not done this every year for decades but you know that you're safe making this commentary about the passage of the sun. Because everybody knows what they're supposed to say in reply. There's like a couple of replies depending on what somebody says and the time of year. Um, like sometimes, especially in the wintertime, people seem to love to remark about driving home in the dark. Oh, I look forward to summer because then I won't have to drive home in the dark. Well, they love to talk about that. I don't know why, but they do. And so, you know, you're safe making a comment about this because they know what they're going to say. They know what the reply is. And, you know, it's, it's a little bonding thing of that. Essentially, if we're going to have to share the same space for a few minutes, such as in the grocery store line or waiting in line, uh, maybe at the DMV or the light, getting your license plate at the county uh, seat. You know that you are essentially standing among friends because we've all now agreed that we hate driving home in the dark or whatever it is. Um, or how nice it is that it stays light outside for hours and hours after work so we can do things. <laughs> I see Spence is just a little contrarian. I can't imagine why Spence has so many problems connecting with people in her town. Can't imagine. On the other hand, but it is a way to show, of, like, are you agreeing? Are you part of this group? Are you out with this group? So it is also a way to social signal to others if you like, you know, you don't want to be part with those people of, you know, to be contrarian. And you then signal to others who also are contrarian to the rest of what those people tend to say and stand for. Oh, oh, is that it? I feel like someone's watched a few too many Animal Planet uh, dog training videos. Oh dear, Spence. Like Spence, have you watched a lot of uh, what's that show? Pits and parole, parolees, or something? Something like that, yeah. But yeah, but again, like 
the way you do these things should, tells people a lot um, about who you are and your thoughts and opinions. And essentially, is this person you know you want in the group or out of the group? Um, <laughs> but actually, nope, never was a fan of Animal Planet. And uh, oh, what was that? I just had this thought. I was going to talk about. Um, like the guy. I know, just ran straight away. Um, although to get back earlier, talking about the mirror and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is going to come up a lot in this season's discussions of be like a kid again. A lot of these are skills that kids pick up easy because they're not overthinking it. But as adults, we tend to have so much baggage about all of these subjects that often get in the way. So like if you are practicing your faces, it's just look in the mirror and don't look at your whole face. Just literally concentrate on what happens when I move different muscles in my face. What does my face look like? What do I think that expression is? Mm -hmm. You know, and is that the expression I'm actually making when I mean to do that one or not? And the what a weird coincidence that, you know, this face when I'm, you know, thinking about the one thing looks just like another one of just you're playing with it though. Play with it whenever you're practicing. When you do small talk, you are playing. There's not a lot of, you know, life and death about small talk. The real point of small talk is to have fun and communicate and feel part of a group. And you very quickly figure out if you're part of that group or not. And if you're not, walk away. Do not Also, suffer. whether that person wants to talk to you, like... Um... And I, when I'm initiating conversation, say, with the person I'm getting my license plate from, hi, how are you? I'm okay. It's a nice day outside. I hope you, are you going to be able to get a chance to go enjoy it? Like, we only get a few of these every year because, like, it sounds most people believe me, it's either too hot or too cold. It is never just right. But when it is just right, it is freaking awesome. And they'll like look like, oh, God, I'd love to, but I have to go to my kids, whatever, today. Or they'll say, yes, I'm fully planning to enjoy this after work. Like, we'll be sure to drive home with the windows down. And they're like, oh, I'm going to. like, And you suddenly you're having a nice, jovial conversation with the person who before couldn't care if you live or die right in front of them and their counter. Of It is a way to connect with people, to win people over to make a connection. I don't like to feel that I'm among enemies or people that wish me dead. Maybe it's my own shortcoming, but I just don't enjoy that feeling. I like to win over people. I like to have those kind of conversations and honestly just talking about the weather and how nice it is or how you're looking forward to winter ending soon and spring will be here, and for a brief flickering moment, it will not be freaking hot. Won't that be lovely? Then it won't be hurricane season yet either. It'll be nice. We'll just have a little bit of nice. It'll be so nice. I hope you're able to get out and barbecue in the nice weather. Oh, thank you. I hope so, too. You know, like that, just it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't, I have not, you know, devoted hours of my time or made any promises to go cook out with someone. I just, you know, wish them well, connected with them as a human being over a conversation about the weather or hurricane season or have you prepared, you know, hurricane season's right around the corner. Oh, yes, we've got water bottles. My husband is loading up the pickup with so, so many, like, Literally, we didn't go on vacation this winter because we had to save for the generator. I'm like, well, did he get the generator? Hell, we had better be a good generator. I'll tell you that. You know, that whatever it is, whatever is going on, now you know a little bit about their life and their generator woes, <laughs> as well as maybe the relationship of their marriage. <laughs> but, like, if you run into them again, 
which, you know, if you live in a town, you're probably going to run into people multiple times. Um, you'd be like, so how's the generator or the husband or the truck? <laughs> Had they all survived hurricane season? I'm like, nope, I got a new husband. Oh, that actually happened to me once where I was like, just truly making just sort of an off the cuff remark about, you know, how she's like, she says, no, nope, I got rid of the husband and I kept the generator. Oh, oh, there's a story there. She's like, yeah, I married the repairman for the generator. I was like, girl. She's like, yeah, I know. But look, I don't have any generator problems anymore. And I don't have any husband problems. And I'm like, pretty fascinating. Like, again, y'all, these are real conversations I've had with real human beings in South Mississippi in my lifetime. And they are wild. It is that time of the year. Uh, Although it is hard for me not to then go into a bit of small talk of, of something I recently found out about, specifically about generators that like I didn't know about that I found fascinating. Oh yeah. Um, and that is that um, there's this thing called a uh, soft start that will let you. Um, so the problem with AC systems is that when your AC compressor starts, it uses a ton of amps to start everything at once. I wonder how many different accounts this person has. Um, and, uh, I didn't even advertise on any of those, um, servers, those discord servers today. Yeah. This is just that time of year. School is out. Mm hmm. Did you put the subscriber thing on? Uh, let me check because I honestly I can't tell you. I'm not. I'm like uh, I've slept since then. I have no idea. All right, that is under. Is that under custom settings? Customization. Mm -hmm. happens so rarely all right yeah it just gives me message delay should I set up a message delay yeah there's one where they can only comment if they're subscribed yeah, um, it's not under this particular stream customization, though. Maybe it's under settings. Let me go check real quick. Yeah, I'm not seeing that one.
Ben says this is not the right communication skills. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah, like, I see there's ways to adjust who can comment, but that's not live chat. Live chat has different settings. Hmm. And well, we can switch it back in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can probably reduce it down to 10 seconds. Okay. I can do that. Oh, there, I found it. How long should they have to be subscribed before they could chat? Five, Previously, we've had it. Five, one, five, ten, or twenty minutes. Ten minutes. So I went to stream customization. It automatically had it at the bottom of the page rather than at the top. And it's at the top of the page. Uh, That's why I was like, it's not where it should be. Yeah, because YouTube is wild. Welcome to summer. Mm -hmm. All the kids are out of school. Mm hmm. They're very bored. Mm hmm. Unsupervised. I mean, again, like this is the problems with, you know, if you don't know how to do small talk. Mm hmm. You do the, well, look at me, witness me. Mm hmm. Stuff that doesn't actually help. Like it doesn't gain you any real validation. You're having to tell yourself you're valid, yourself said. Mm -hmm. Versus when you can actually do a small talk well, you can develop friendships. You can do it with people who want to see you, who you know enjoy seeing you. Well, now that I found the subscriber one, should I remove the slow mode? Yeah, or what's the minimum on slow mode? Well, I mean, I guess I could put one second in. Yeah. All right. Because the only people who are talking more than once a second are yeah, good point. bots. All right. So, what should we talk about small talk? I mean, part of it, I, as I was talking before, was have fun, play. Mm -hmm. The whole point of small talk is to have an enjoyable interaction. It's also how you tell your body that it can relax. Mm -hmm. It's the other thing, like, people don't realize why they need small talk, is when you small talk, you can relax, you will feel better, and you don't have the problems of always being uptight, always being worried, and you're trying, like, how do I, how do I pet the back of my brain to tell it it's okay? You do small talk. You have other people smile at you and have positive interactions, and the back of your brain goes, oh, I am safe. Mm -hmm. I am among people. I'm among friends. Thanks, CD. <laughs> Good to know. Also, that is the use for those really silly jokes. You know, dad, the ones we now call dad jokes. 
Mm -hmm. is there are ones that are purposefully silly, ridiculous, yeah, childish, you know, Pun obvious. No. Yeah. Yeah. Is because they are only told in a way to show that we are all safe. Yeah, they're amusing, but maybe not deep guffaws usually. But just, yeah, we're here, we're safe, we're among friends, we're okay. Here's a really dumb joke that we can all, like, chuckle at. You know, and it's a way of saying, you know, that person also opening up of, like, yeah, I'm telling something that absolutely anyone could ridicule me for mm -hmm. telling this joke. But we're all going to laugh instead. And it shows that, yeah, we're all on the same beat and we're all having a good time. Mm -hmm. Oh, Spence, you don't know, though, how much I love a well-earned groan. Oh, God, boy. And I loved it. What was it the, last night? Was it Brian or Charlie made Tom groan as, as you went to your room? Oh, I felt so good to my soul. Just to hear Tom groan since he makes me groan. So often with his stupid jokes. But, but yeah, all the things that growing up were just like, why do adults do this? This is the most ridiculous stuff. These jokes are so bad. Mm hmm. Yes. A good groaner. Mm hmm. But it is the way we communicate with the back of our brain mm -hmm. and the back of everyone else's brain. Yeah. Of the, I am not a threat. Right. I have told a joke so bad that I am obviously not in any way endangering you because you now definitely feel superior to me. Yes. I used to love the Laffy Taffy jokes, you know, that were on the printed in very oh, tiny yes. on the Laffy Taffy wrappers. I remember, like, it was honestly one of the selling points of Laffy Taffy for me over some other candies. Because I am old enough to remember back when Laffy Taffy was in the penny candy drawers at convenience stores and other stores. And you could get, you could get a whole, like, Laffy Taffy for a penny. Plus tags. Just, I really feel like you should not charge tax for less than a dollar. I'm just saying. But I loved, like, I, I'd get it. I love Starlight Mints back in the day. And I loved Laffy Taffy. And I loved Now and Laters. Um, but I would get a Laffy Taffy over a Starlight or a Now and Later or a Butterscotch because it came with a joke that I could then read out loud and make whoever was within earshot grown. I loved it at convenience stores to peel it off, pop it in my mouth, stick it in my cheek, like a little chipmunk and then read it out loud to whoever's there and watch perfect strangers groan, roll their eyes and chuckle as they walk back to their car. Like this just made me so happy as a kid to do this. When I could get a reaction out of, especially adults, but also like the people I was with, whoever. I just loved it. But yeah, like, again, this is a way we bond. Of it is, it is a way of showing weakness. And saying, here, here's your chance. If you're going to attack me, attack me over something small that I don't care about. Mm -hmm. Or show that you're part of the group and you're going to still be okay. Even though, yes, I know the joke is so bad. But it's how we bond and how we make friends. And yeah, a good, bad joke is always useful to have in your back pocket. I mean, one of the most surprising things I ever learned that I I never dreamed was in any way true when I was a teenager is pickup lines really do work <laughs> more than in half because they are supposed to be bad. 
Like if you can make them groan and giggle, you've got a good chance of getting that person to go out on a date with you. And also means they're receptive. Yeah. You know, because people don't laugh at jokes uh, when they're not receptive. Mm hmm. It's uh -huh. why I mean, it's why I follow and how they developed to follow uh, following uh, a couple. I think it was the names Haley and Kendra. And it is almost always these bad lesbian pickup lines. Mm -hmm. That Haley will say to Kendra, and Kendra just all Kendra knows is Haley has the camera out and is recording her response. What is she about to hear? And then you see as it plays across her face as she figures out the pickup line, and then just oh no, no, that's bad, that is wrong, you know, or just or giggling or whatever. Of mm -hmm. but they're fun. And that is actually the part is that they are like dad jokes. They are supposed to be bad. Mm -hmm. That is what an actual good pickup line is. But yeah, like if they're not receptive, they're not going to laugh. It's a quick way to tell if somebody is you know, interested in being friends or anything. Because if you don't feel safe, you don't laugh. Uh, that one is just one of the worst. Oh, it's terrible. You don't have to click on it, Tom. You don't have to memorialize it for eternity in this video. Look, it's the part where I know that specific one has worked at least three separate times I have witnessed. Do you know which one I get the most? Hmm. Did it hurt when you fell? Oh, God, yeah. That's the one I get the most. Aimed at me, I mean. The worst part is I'm a klutzy person. So half the time I don't realize it's a pickup line because I literally just tripped, like, usually leaving the ladies' room. <laughs> they, oh, God, like, they saw. It's like, oh, oh. Yeah, it was kind of embarrassing back there, wasn't it? Like... <laughs> And they're like, wait, what? Like, I just frequently derail pickup lines, not on purpose. I know, it's the difficulties with neurodivergent people. Is our responses are often a little different. Yep. But I mean, I... I practice my compliments um, when I'm out working every day because I go to a lot of restaurants and I see a lot of different people. And it's just a good way, it's just a good mental exercise for me of like, what do I notice about other people? Mm -hmm. And what is a positive thing I can say? Mm. But it does mean that I do get better service at most of these restaurants because they've had positive experiences with me. Yeah, And so they are also a bit more forgiving when I'm smooth that day. Yeah. I mean, I've been out with Tom and most servers at restaurants remember him. Like we've gone to go to a restaurant and they'll ask, oh, are you here for pickup? And Tom's like, uh, actually, no, we wanted to be seen. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and they'll do that. <laughs> Look, he's going to stay. <laughs> one, one server literally announced that to the back. He's going to stay. Like, but they do remember you and, and they definitely have positive associations with you. So it obviously works. And other, yeah, there doesn't have to be any ulterior motives to compliment someone other than to say you see them and you agree with, you know, whatever you're complimenting them about and validating that. Whether it's the way they decide to style their hair or mm -hmm. the clothes they decided to wear or, you know, their sense of fashion, whatever it is. Yeah. You're validating that you also agree with that. Mm -hmm. And there's a positive interaction. And it only takes a couple positive interactions for people to remember you and to mm -hmm. then be helpful. You just 
you never know when you're going to see them again. It is true. And in what context you'll see them. I mean, it definitely helps when it turns out that they work for city government when you have problems and you have to go in. Yep. It's a lot easier when they've already got a positive feeling towards you. Mm -hmm. You just never know who you're going to run into in the world. So it helps if you already have a positive interaction with them. Well, on that note, what a lovely time to take a little breaky break. Maybe it's time to check in with your bladder or get a snack or something to drink. And we'll see you back here in approximately 10 minutes.
Me mana me, me mana me mana, me mana me, me mana me, me mana me, me mana me, me mana me. Okay. Hope everyone got something to drink. Had a snack, checked on the smoker. It is now raining, so the smoker's a little chilled. Can't imagine. So it's definitely I'm just gonna leave those the chicken in there as long as possible. Mm-hmm. So final thoughts, Tom. Have fun play. Find other people to have fun and play with. That is a lot of the purpose of small talk. Is to have a good time with other people. If you're not having a good time, you're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. So be like a kid and just play at it. There's no right or wrong way. And even if it's, you know, this small talk is not working right now, it's, well, then leave. You don't have to keep small talking with someone else you don't like. Yeah. If it's not working, they're not in the right mood, move on. It's fine. Yeah. Not everybody's in a chatty mood every day. It's not a reflection on you. Just move on to greener pastures. And have fun with the way you start conversations. Just practice and play. As I said, like, I play a game when I am out doing my job of what can I compliment other people on? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I definitely had that problem growing up where I was, all I heard compliments on were my genetics, things mm -hmm. I had no choice over. Yeah. Same. Talking about somebody's eyes being pretty is not a compliment. Talking about their eye shadow and their makeup looks amazing. How they figure out those colors is a good compliment. Mm -hmm. You know, the your eyes really pop. How would you figure out, you know, the makeup to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, but having fun with it. Oh, if you don't like someone, you don't need to compliment them. As you know, Spence likes to like say of like she's. She's more of the, I don't want to be seen as part, what was it? I don't want to be part of the cultist. Yes. Of just talk with the ones you want to. Mm -hmm. Talk with the ones you like the look of or who are in the same kind of mood you are. It's totally fine if you're not feeling well to try to make small talk with other people who obviously look uncomfortable as well. Yep. And someday you will get old enough that you can start doing the old person kids these days. What's wrong with them? <laughs> Why can't they be like we were perfect in every way? Oh, what's the matter with kids today? Yeah, but like it just have fun with it. Like I, I think as adults, we keep forgetting that so much of life should be fun. So go have fun mm -hmm. with it. You don't have to be miserable while you're doing everything, while you're practicing and learning a skill. You'll learn and practice a lot more if you're enjoying it. Mm -hmm. It's why we like to play games. We're practicing getting better at something. Yep. But it's fun. I like having a cat because I can sometimes be a bit mean to them and they're like, yes, let's play. Oh, they don't take it personally. Yeah. They just take and it as throwing the gauntlet down. Yes. Yes. Challenge ha -ha. accepted. Yeah. Yeah, I saw a meme every morning. Finley wakes up and chooses violence. And it was this little orange tabby kitten that already had both of his claws, his arms wrapped around a socked foot and was about to, ah. 
I saw one recently I haven't posted to the cats group and it was, you know, changes since I've got a cat, um, low mood, decreased, violent crimes, rise. <laughs> All right. I don't know if I have any, let me think, small talk. I mean, if children can do it, you can too. I've, I've yet to have a student that I couldn't teach how to do small talk easier. And it improved everyone's confidence. To feel that you can navigate the outside world and essentially strike a conversation up with any stranger you come across is definitely confidence boosting. Um, it's a skill that people do not value. And yet once they have it, it adds so much more to their life. Now, I will say the caveat is it very much helps if you are in a place that is open to talking to strangers. But here is what I will say to that as somebody who grew up in the Deep South, where everybody is very chatty. And I have traveled to other locations around the planet where people are less chatty. And everyone warns me they, they don't, don't talk to strangers. People don't like that. They may mug you if you try to talk to them. Number one, knock on wood. I've still never been mugged. Especially I've never been mugged to anybody I started a conversation with. I have had three attempted muggings. And each time I laughed at them for trying to mug me. And uh, it was because I had no money on me. And I was like, oh, you are not having a good day, are you? So technically, the small talk actually helped me not be mugged. Because there was nothing to mug. Like, literally, I'm pulling out my wallet showing the emptiness. Like, behold, moths flying out of it. Um, you're just not having a good day. You're just not picking good people, huh? And I have passed off my good jewelry that I was wearing at the time as costume jewelry. It's just glass, buddy. Like, I mean, I did lie. But um, anyway, uh, I have had plenty of small talk with people in Seattle and New York City, Manhattan, Hong Kong, Manila, British Columbia, Vancouver. All sorts of places, Las Vegas, uh, a wide variety of cities, including Atlanta and Dallas, Fort Worth, and El Paso. Oh, they are not chatty there. And yet, I was able to strike up conversations everywhere I went. So, once you have the confidence, people kind of fall in with you. Mm -hmm. But it, I will acknowledge, it does help to start with people who are more chatty. Hence, I really recommend Leo Lowndes tips for getting people to initiate a conversation with you. Like where you wear some interesting doodad on your clothes so that if they want to chat, they could make a comment about that and so on. Of It helps if you are feeling shy or not confident to have other people strike a conversation with you. So I understand that, but I'm here to tell you being a neurodivergent person and realizing that you can strike up a conversation with anybody on this planet and it will go well is such a confidence boost. I really recommend it for everybody. And that, um, you know, just continue to, even if you already technically can do it, but continue honing your skills. You never deplete the source, essentially. I mean, it is a nice positive feedback system of the more, the more you practice it, the more positive results you have, the easier it is, mm -hmm. the more fun it is, the more you do it. So again, um, it's, it's good to practice it. And as I said, I've never actually been mugged in part because I, you know, essentially made it a conversation of, oh, you are not having a good day. If you are picking me. I don't have a Rolex. I'm not wearing quality shoes. You're having a rough day, aren't you? And I mean, this was this was at knife point. <laughs> Three different times. And each time they're like, oh, 
shoot. Picked the wrong person again. Oh, it really is a bad day, huh? Hmm, I'm sorry. You know, and, and like, yeah, one time I did give him a tip. Look, I saw this businessman three blocks away. We just interacted, right? We just crossed each other's paths. Look, he was a total asshole to me. And he, I literally, I don't know if it was a real Rolex or if it was a knockoff because I'm not that good at these things. But look, you can, you maybe still be able to catch him. Totally get him. He literally tried to trip me. And he's like, okay, I'm going now. Like, oh, good luck. Be careful. So, yes, I did do that once. And that was um, in the French Quarter at New Orleans. <laughs> I don't regret it. I said, that man tried to trip me with his fucking briefcase. And I'm like, hey, watch it. And he just, he literally flipped me off. And, I mean, it's not like it was a busy street. We were literally the only two people on this road. And he was being rude. So, it's like, yeah, go mug him. He looks like he's got some of that briefcase. At the very least, I said, at the very least, I know that briefcase is at least $175. Because I was looking to buy my then husband a briefcase as a gift. So I know how much that one costs. Because I was I was looking at that. But I don't have that kind of money. And he's like, okay, I'll get the briefcase. Like, yeah. Don't let him tell you it's not worth it. That's a good briefcase. Which I had noticed. That was, I knew that briefcase. So, yeah. It helps to be nice to people and not flip them off and trip them. I'm just saying. Versus the opposite. If you're conversational to them, you've made an ally. And we neurodivergent people need allies everywhere we go. So there, that's my final thoughts. Oh, I am that bad auntie, aren't I? Now that I think about it, oh dear. Anyway. Yes. What to expect on next Monday's episode. Okay. Hey. Oh God, what else that's... did I need to tell my younger self? All right. On June 19th, we're going to be talking about getting older. And Tom's pitch was why kids bounce and adults break. What to do about getting older. I have no idea. That was all Tom told me, so I wrote it down. I assume it's eat more jello. Nope. Although that will help. Yeah, no, seriously, people do not underestimate the value of gelatin. And yes, by the way, if if you don't consume pork gelatin, that is fine. There is fish gelatin. It is made from tilapia bones and other fish. And that, you know, so I'm just saying, even if you don't do pork, there's beef gelatin and there's fish gelatin and all of them are great for your joints and your skin. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But yes, uh, it's time, essentially it's, you know, learning from what you used to do as kids that helps kids more often bounce and not hurt themselves versus adults. I've been surprised, you know, when I tore my ACL to find out how many people all have a similar story when you tear an ACL and it is never playing a sport. Mm -mm. It is an everyday mundane thing when it tears. So uh, what I was told by an orthopedist is why do some people bounce and some people break? Why do even children sometimes break? And why do drunks tend to walk away from car accidents they cause? And it's for the same reason. If you are very relaxed and you don't tighten up right before an impact, you're far less likely to break. So young children tend to not notice or know what the fall sensation means is that there's going to be a slam. And so they don't tense up. It's why drunks tend to survive deadly car accidents and sober people don't because drunks are so out of their head that they don't know to tighten up. Uh, often they're half asleep or entirely asleep, actually. Uh, and so they're fully relaxed. And so they're far less likely to actually break. And that is what I've been told by orthopedists, several of them, of that's actually the 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 danger, the damage comes from tensing up. So if you know an accident is, is imminent, just relax. It's, you can't stop it already. So just, just relax into it. And since uh, I've been in my early 30s, I've tried to do that. And miraculously, that advice actually has worked. Of When you know the accident is imminent and there is nothing you can do to stop this, 
You just bring it. Bring it like Elmo with the fire behind him. Yep, just bring it. Mm-hmm. And that has actually protected me from some serious injuries where other people like had life threatening injuries. Um, and even when I fall on my bum, I've fallen on my hip again, this whole, well, okay, just roll into it of, I mean, thankfully I'm very padded behind. So, and I've fallen enough that I know I'll be okay. Um, thankfully. But the tensing up is where the damage often comes from. And it's because the tensing up prevents the energy of the impact of the slam from moving throughout your body. Uh, Because if the energy is able to be displaced over more of your body, there's less likely for a breakage. Because the energy can go all the way out of you. Um, But that's not like the only thing Tom wanted to talk about. Oh, no, I've got plenty for, but essentially how to, but how to regain some youth. There's a bunch I have learned of late, and I feel like a lot of people can use them. Mm-hmm. So, we will see y'all next week. We hope you had a lovely time. We had a wonderful time having you, and if you are watching this on the replay, please let us know what you think in the comments. Good night, everybody. Good night.